I have to admit, I struggled uh, with this passage. You may have seen I was on Facebook about it. Uh, struggling to work out where it all fitted together. Uh, normally when you're dealing with Paul, he's got a pattern of things, you know. You go, you go look at the fruits of the Spirit, and he's got a pattern worked out of his orderly, you know, it's, it's organised. And I couldn't see that pattern, I couldn't work out that pattern at all. For the, this list he's got here of the works of the sinful human nature, what sinful human nature does when it's cast off with strength. I couldn't see the struggle, I couldn't see the pattern. And I woke up early Saturday morning thinking this through with a headache, trying to think, Rrr. you know those moments when the utter, the obvious hits you? You know that sort of thing? And not necessarily because your wife's told you either. But when oh, the light goes in, oh, yeah, it comes. Yeah, there it is. I woke up and I just went, oh, it's obvious. There is no order to this, this list. There is no structure to this list of the works of the sinful human nature. It is just chaotic, writhing, seething mass of disorganised, disordered, and disorderly sin. And maybe that's Paul's point. It is out of control, it is chaotic. It is disorganised, ill-disciplined, going with the flow, it's a tangled mess. And that is totally what the unrestrained, unredeemed, unsanctified, sinful human nature is like. It goes with what it feels like. It goes with the flow. And in English, what flows out has got a word for it. Do you know what that word is? Stuff that flows out? A river. Effluent. Yeah? Effluent is what flows out, isn't it? And that's what you've got here. As our American cousins might say, go figure. Well, that's what Paul's got here. Maybe you'd think, you Galatians, that taking away the law would result in all of this stuff that Paul lists out here. But these are the works of the sinful, unrestrained human nature. And of course, if you just take away outward legalistic restraint, which is not what Paul is suggesting, here's what definitely will result. This jumbled mess. Paul is trying to point that out. So when the human being says, I'll do what I like, the other little guy in the, in the diagram there said, okay, but if you do, this is what it's going to be like. This jumbled, chaotic mess. Sexual immorality, selfish ambition, factions, jealousy, envy, impurity, drunkenness, fits of rage, witchcraft, dissensions, debauchery, orgies, discord. Am I repeat that? I don't know. Society, our society, post the 1960s, is visible proof of the fact. Our lawless society is like this. Wherever and whenever people cast up restraint, this is the sort of stuff you get. Go out into the estate. Wander around the houses. This is what you get. Sinful human nature asserts itself and you get this chaotic mess that mangles up your life. If you've removed the restraints and put nothing in their place. Let's just quickly get to the detail and see how it goes. I've tried to order this list a little bit because I can't cope with it otherwise, but the ordering is not completely successful. It's a bit like trying to convert expressionist art into a line drawing. It doesn't work. So it's just a jumbled mess. Sinful nature in itself is self-expressive, and that self-expression perverts the way society ought to work, mangles it up. So hatred, hatred discord, and fits of rage, they, they mess with social relationships. Envy, jealousy, selfish ambition, those things find expression and they mess with social relationships. Factions and dissensions, the way people divide up into groups and tribalism and so on. It messes up the way God intends for society to be. And when you take away external restraint, this is what you get. This is the way it goes. Sinful nature, self-expressive, insists on its right to express itself and that's what results from it. Sinful human nature is self-assertive when you take, take the restraints off it. And this is what you get out of that. A perversion of spirituality. When you assert the self, you take God out of the place that God should have in human life and existence. We're asserting the self. We're taking God, as it were, off his throne and putting our sinful self on that throne. And here's what comes out of that. Witchcraft, idolatry. Now I can, I can go into the Greek words if you like. Can we do that? I, mean, I can tell you, I can spell out what pharmakeia is all about, this witchcraft and how it works. But what that does, what witchcraft does, is it, it takes God out of his place and tries to manipulate the way things are going on in the world in a mechanistic sort of way, by ritual and sacrifice in some cases. And you end up with human beings trying to take the authority and the rule away from God and to manipulate things in this way. 
idolatry, again, a perversion of spirituality, taking created things and putting them in the place that God should have in your life, whether it's a, a molten bronze thing, statue standing on something or other, and plinth and you, you know, coat out a bit, or whether it's your car. Or your, I'm trying not to look at people and think of things they've got. Because <laughs> that wouldn't be kind. I if I it. lay myself open. <laughs> but, do you see the point? It, it, it's taking that which God has made and making a God of it. As Isaiah mocks the craftsman. Who takes a piece of wood, makes his idol, bows down to it, says this is my God. And uses the same wood to light his fire, to boil his stew. Mm -hmm. Idolatry. Taking God out of his place and putting something else. And then these words for drunkenness and orgies, they're words that are taken, and why are they under religion? Well, they could be under sort of two categories, couldn't they? Drunkenness is a bad thing because it takes away your human dignity. It takes away the dignity that God created for human beings to have. And drunkenness in scripture, not drink, but drunkenness, is consistently spoken out about. It's not God's way, it's not God's norm for human life. But those two words, drunkenness and orgies, they, they, they come from... Well, they, they come from the Bacchanalian revels. Uh, what do we know about the Bacchanalian revels? If you did O-level Latin, or GCSE Latin even, then you'd be, oh yes, the feasts of Bacchus. Oh, yeah. Read about that in, I don't know, Catullus or Petronius or somebody. Okay. But we didn't, so, <laughs> so let's go <laughs> over it again. Um, basically, what they did in, in the ancient world was they got a number of things that appealed to their sinful human nature all mangled up together. So they got together their, uh, their, their worship of the, the, the Bacchus, you know, the, the idolatry, religion, and they mixed in quite a lot of alcohol, and then they mixed in sexual immorality and these, these orgiastic rites. Quite a popular mix, as it happened. There was quite a lot of, you know, they had a good following, shall we say. And, and of course, mixing sex and religion, or mixing intoxicating things and religion, that happens in all sorts of contexts today, and wouldn't be aware of it. What they were doing was taking these things and using them, and twisting spirituality by asserting their own sinful nature, their own desires, wishes, and wants, in the place of what God has given us. And that's how the sinful human nature perverts spirituality in so many ways. Sex and religion, heavy mix to this day. You've got to watch it. Um, <clears throat> did anybody see that I, I just posted a, a link to a, a, a blog on the Grace page this week? Did you, did you see that? I, just, I, from, I, post, I, I linked to a post on a blog by a lady in America who was talking about romantic pornography. It's worth a look, okay? I won't sort of go into it. But it, it's, it's something messy, but it's kind of interesting to have a look at. Um, to, to see where that goes. Um, sex and religion, a heady mix, and you've just got to watch it. And that's, that's the way human nature goes. Uh, what else have we got? Yeah. Sinful nature is self-gratifying. -gratif and you can see the orgy thing sort of links across, doesn't it? With perverting, perverting human sexuality. Orgy, sexual immorality, debauchery, impurity. You, you don't really need to go into the Greek to know what's going on here. It's a reckless love of sin. Now that's what taking the rules and the regulations and the outward restraint away from people actually does. Paul's forthright comments about not reimposing the Jewish law with all its moral values, however, is what he's been doing in the, in, in, in the first part of the book. You know, don't go back and reimpose the Jewish law on these people who've come to Christ and been saved by grace through faith alone. Don't impose those values back on them. He's not encouraging this sort of thing by saying the rule book. On the contrary. This is what happens if you do away with the rule book and leave nothing that God has given us behind. If you take away the rule book and you throw away the law and throw away all the legal constraints on human life, before the Spirit of God has come into a human being and started giving birth to the fruits of the Spirit, then this is what you will get. But Paul is not proposing it. He's proposing turning from sin and trusting in Jesus. He's proposing that the Spirit of God then comes into that human being and produces fruit in keeping with repentance, as Scripture describes it. And then you don't get this 
ugly, chaotic, self-assertive, self-expressive, self-gratifying manifestation of the pig obvious works of the flesh. The works of the sinful human nature, if you cast off restraint and let it run, they're obvious, they're ugly, and Paul says finally they're hellish. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God.